Welcome to Empowering Communities and Overdose Prevention, a 2023 NOPEN Year in Review. My name is Merlene Tucker, and I'll be running today's web forum along with my colleague, Jeff Bornstein. Today's web forum is sponsored by the National Overdose Prevention Network, a program of PHI Center for Health, Leadership and Impact, and produced by Dialogue for Health. Now, let's meet the moderator of today's event, Dr. Mary Maddox Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is a coach and preparedness consultant for the California Overdose Prevention Network, a program of the PHI Center for Health Leadership and Impact. She serves as the Sonoma County Public Health Officer and Division Director and the Chief Medical Officer of the Redwood Community Health Coalition for Sonoma, Napa, Yolo and Marin counties. She has been a board member and chair of the Latino Coalition for Healthy California. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much. And welcome to all of you to today's webinar. It's very exciting. We're gonna look at the whole year of 2023 in review. And it's uh, for those of you who have seen these videos before, joined our webinars before, this is a great opportunity to really see uh, the pearls of kind of each one of these webinars. And for those of you who have not had the opportunity to see them, you will really enjoy this. And you can link to the complete webinar for each of those that we're going to present the summary of today on our website, the NOPEN website. Yeah, the next slide, this is the agenda for today. It is all about empowering communities, your communities in overdose prevention. Um, really want to thank all of you again for obviously joining us today, but most importantly for the incredible work that each of you is doing in your community throughout the country. Um, we will be going through each of these and I think you will really find ex these extremely helpful. They kind of run the gamut of one-on-one, -on -one, what we can do for overdose prevention, how you can take care of yourself as somebody who is providing the services, and some of the updates on the changes in uh, treatment and in also what is what we are confronting in terms of drugs that are being used. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So here they are. We're going to talk about harm reduction for fentanyl, the X waiver, the elimination of the X waiver requirement, overdose prevention and outreach with LGBTQ community plus communities, the 988 crisis lifeline that started this year, harm reduction and how to do this in collaboration with faith-based communities, seven types of risk, very important for all of you joining, and overdose prevention 101, a great resource, new resource that's available, and then xylazine. Yeah, one of the things I wanna say is like, I think the main thing is to listen to what people need and want, like stigma. Like one, breaking down your own personal stigma and recognizing the stigma is, is prevalent so prevalent in our community, because of the war on drugs, because of criminalization of drug use. So even your own clients, participants might have internalized stigma. So trying to build trust and just show up where people are at. Not everyone's gonna want treatment. Not everyone's gonna wanna stop using drugs and that's okay. Like you wanna show up there where people are at because you wanna avoid people dying. And that is what happens when there's stigma. And I'm not like, like I've had close friends of mine who are harm reduction workers who were just their own internalized stigma, they died because they wouldn't share that they were using drugs. And that's something that I just like, for me, work on that. Everyone needs to work on that in our own spaces. And not just assume that because we work with people who use drugs or we care about this that we don't have stigma, it's internalized as part of our society, right? That's a very like general one. Because <laughs> um, I think that kills a lot of people. Um, and the second thing, the more practical side of like from reduction things that people can do, um, naloxone, just like learn, know how to use it, know, um, have it around, have it accessible for people. Don't limit how much people are getting, just to like, give it to people. Um, a lot of it's gonna be people who use drugs who are the ones gonna be responding to overdoses. So people are asking for 10 kids, give them 10 kids. You know, that's, and limit the barriers of access, right? Like don't ask them a million questions of why they need it, why they're using it. Cause that actually will create a barrier of people being able to access it. Um, remember that people in your community might be like, you might have people in your life who are using drugs and you might not even know it and just like, being able to open those conversations up in, in every space you're in. Um, it can be coworkers, friends, people in your community, your clients, like building the trust with people makes it easier for people to trust you and to talk about what their drug use is. Um, the other thing I want to say is that if you are, if people are using fentanyl, 
Um, just some like more practical things that people can do. We've talked a lot about switching from injection to snorting or smoking fentanyl. Um, one, because injection use, um, there's a lot of side effects to injection use, obviously, like um, there's a lot of like, people can get like HIV, we fish our needles, especially if there's some access to pain needles and things like that. But also um, it's a higher risk of overdose with injection because it goes straight into the bloodstream, which means that it's, a, it's much faster to, for people to overdose. Whereas smoking or snorting, um, people are still gonna get high. Um, but it's just a, you know, some delayed risk, there's some delayed a little bit, and there's like a less chance of people um, overdosing than if they're injection versus injection. Um, and that can mean that in your community, like, what does it mean for people to access clean pipes, clean smoking supplies, right? Like, so they're not sharing their pipes, so they're not smoking from a broken pipe, so they can use clean supplies. What does it mean for those like policies in your community, in your organization? Like, how do you promote, give that out? Um, also like not limiting the access that people have to those things as well. That's another thing that I want to say. Um, also reminding people that to, even if you know your dealer, even if you know your supply, even if you're testing your drugs, like, you know, fentanyl test strips are great. They're a great tool, but fentanyl test strips, test strips for the most part will test mostly if this, uh, for positive. You should trust the positive result and not the negative because a lot of times fentanyl will not mix well with other drugs. So. Um, there might be a pocket that you just didn't test when you were testing it. So reminding people to, um, that if you're going to be testing your drugs, to just like always, always trust your positive result, less the negative result for that. Um, and that if you're going to be mixing with other drugs, always try to start with um, the opiate or like the fentanyl before you mix anything else. That so way you know how it feels in the body. Um, even if you know your supplier and your drug, making sure that you are using less. Every batch can, every batch can be different. Um, I was sharing this with Mary, we were having a conversation earlier um, when we were working on this, when I was working at the supervised injection site, we were just like, we stopped relying on what people were telling us they were using. We just started like, just being like, what batch is this? Like, cause we had to like, every batch was different. Some batches, mm, it was fine. Some batches we would get the next day, a different batch. And that batch would be like everyone would be overdosing that day because it was so strong. So we like, so just like use less. We always tell people use less. Like if you're not sure, just use less, um, use slower. Um, another thing that I tell people is like, is try not to use alone. This can be really hard for a lot of people, especially because of stigma, um, especially because like people sometimes create rituals around how we use drugs. So, but a lot of, overdoses and deaths are happening because people are using alone. Like I can give an example that happened here in San Francisco where like uh, during the pandemic, a lot of folks who were like, um, who lived on the streets or like um, didn't have homes were put into shelters, into, into SRO supportive housing, um, which was a great, it was beautiful. I'm glad that they had a place to be, but that took away their community. Suddenly they were all alone. Um, suddenly they were using their rooms alone and there was no one there to respond. And we saw so many deaths happen in those buildings because of that as a result. Um, and that's something that happens. So making sure there's community around, and that means like that you're gonna be using, be around them. Um, another tool that I've, I've used to use with friends who didn't want me there physically, I would just stay on the phone with them. Like I would just put my phone on and be like, we agree that if you didn't respond to me after five minutes, I could call 911, you know, or after like we made a time agreement depending on the batch. Um, what was happening with the supply. Um, check in with people in your community about what the supply is looking like. Like people know, people who use drugs know. If things are changing, they will tell you that things are changing. Um, especially if we don't have testing. Uh, San Francisco is just starting drug testing here. Um, that drug testing does help a lot because you can like know, but it's gonna be the first, the people who are gonna know the first are gonna be people who are using drugs. So like talk to them, be like, what is it looking like right now? Um, how, what is it happening when you're responding to, to an overdose? How are people like feeling with this batch or that batch? Um, so some like more practical things that I think are useful. Um, and then there's like things I can just in general in harm reduction tips, which is to just like, always remember to listen to people who, who are directly affected, you know, like incorporate them into your policies, decision makers into your organizations. Like what does it look like to work with people who use drugs? You know, what does it look like to, to, to make decisions, to make policy, to like uh, provide programming 
based on the experiences of people who use drugs, not on what you think is best, not on what you think that should be happening, um, but based on what people are actually experiencing. And like I am in San Francisco, San Francisco looks very different to a rural area. Canada looks very different to the United States. Uh, there's things that can translate, but there's things that are very specific to the area you're in. And that the best thing you can do is just talk to people or be around people who are directly affected. You know, like if you're someone who uses drugs, your voice, that's what should be listened to. But the larger issue, like drug use is, doesn't live alone. It's part of like a larger systemic thing. Like it's about housing, it's about food, it's about race, you know, it's about the things that are part of our society that also need to be addressed. Like in San Francisco, for example, we're seeing so many people who've been displaced because of housing. Um, and that is leading to like difficult conditions, to isolation, to to them being like not even not, not having housing. Um, we've also seen, like I mentioned at the beginning, like in San Francisco, on a positive note, we I think we are one of the only cities in the country that has lowered the amount of overdose deaths that have happened. So we went from seven seven hundred twenty five people who died from overdoses in twenty twenty one to no in twenty twenty to six hundred twenty people who died from overdoses last last year. Um, which is a big deal because most of the country has it's been the opposite. A lot of it has to do with the policies that have been in place, with no loss in distribution. Um, but even despite those numbers, we're still seeing that Black communities are disproportionately affected by overdose death. And that's like a, that's a race issue, right? Like, what is it happening that we're not reaching Black communities? What is happening that we're not able to, to provide care like to those communities and to provide harm reduction services to those communities? How do we work with Black communities to be able to provide that care? Um, same thing with Latinx communities. Like one of the reasons that we're doing the Spanish training is because we want to be able to go to Latinx communities and do it in Spanish. So people like in their communities can understand in your own language rather than having translation. Um, so that's why we're doing like we're doing trainings in Spanish as well. Um, so those are like some of the things that we're like trying to address and like that I think are like some of the barriers that also exist. Well, Andrea Figueroa does such an amazing job in this webinar. I really like how she combines very practical issues about harm reduction with these really profound areas of recognizing internalized stigma, um, looking at the intersectionality of, of substance use with other issues, and very importantly, you know, showing up where people are, um, meeting them where they are. Uh, really uh, encourage you to both for this webinar and for all the others, use these webinars, uh, bring them to, to your coalitions or to meetings you have or with your staff. Uh, I think they're just uh, very valuable tools for, uh, to, that can be used. Um, we're going to go on to our next uh, presentation, and that's going to be on the, about the X waiver with Dr. Ronit Lev, the end of the X waiver, fortunately. The X waiver prob problem was given to Congress to solve, and it took three years. And this year, January, 2023, the X waiver was finally eliminated with the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, the MAT Act. And Biden created the X waiver as a Senator and signed its death certificate as president. And today, any doctor with a DEA license can prescribe buprenorphine without it, they added X waiver government regulation. But there's a catch. While the president removed the mandated eight hour education with regulation, Congress put it back in. What do you see, um, what can be done or what has been done on an, so that this doesn't, just isn't the response of a single physician, but really organizations, institutions take this on and provide some of that support, support that you mentioned is so needed? So increasing MAT or MOUD across institutions and making it an integrated part of medical care requires leadership, education, and incentives. And I would emphasize that this should be for all addiction, not just for opioids. The goal is important from a top-down as well as bottom-up approach. So from the top-down, we've seen the federal government uh, go into place to remove the X waiver, make uh, Narcan over-the-counter. That's big, and we really need to be thankful for that. But of course, we want more. And there needs to be incentives for screening for substance use disorder and for treatment. So for example, there was a government incentive to screen for tobacco use and refer patients to tobacco cessation. We received a few dollars per smoker and that created a huge motivation. We screened everybody for tobacco use and we referred them all to treatment. It was a bit humorous for me that we counseled smokers, but we didn't say a word about injecting drugs or smoking methamphetamine. We weren't paid to do that, but we can create such incentives through Medicare and commercial insurance. From the bottom 
up, we need institution, institutions and community clinics to create the partnerships. What makes addiction care different than cardiology or pulmonology specialty care is that addiction treatment, detox rehabs are provided outside the traditional walls of the hospital system. Therefore, partnerships need to be created that may not exist in hospital clinics and doctor's offices. And that's where coalitions could be of great assistance. Each hospital and medical group needs a community addiction partner. Coalitions can help build these partnerships. And in San Diego, for example, created a, a program way back when called Adopt an Emergency Department, where we made sure every emergency department has an addiction clinic um, to follow up with. Electronic health records uh, can be adjusted to be more proactive in screening for addiction and have built-in dot phrases and treatment sets for um, MOUD. Speaking of our audience, we've seen we have people from throughout the United States, people who are, are engaged in, in um, addressing the issue of opioid addiction and treatment uh, in different through different roles. What are some concrete steps that they can take in their communities to try to support the adoption of MAT among providers in their community? Right. So that's a great question. And there are two things. Everyone on this call. Um, can help uh, do and, and elevate. One of them is resources, and the second one is partnerships. Resources you already mentioned. So there's an educational gap that needs to be closed, and the California Bridge Program and the National Clinical Consultation Center are great resources that really need um, to be publicized and are available for free for um, the medical community to use anywhere in the United States. So the California Bridge uh, program, as you mentioned, it, um, the resources we'll put in the chat is cabridge.org. They have great tools on how to start buprenorphine quickly in the emergency department or how to do self-start of buprenorphine out, outside. So that's a great resources, the California Bridge program. And the other resources is with the National Clinical Consultation Center, the NCCC. They provide professional to professional advice in treating opiate use disorder as well as alcohol and poly substance use. So you have a complex patient or it's your very first time, you know, you have your buprenorphine, you can write for it, you don't know how, what doses, but there's other problems, you have questions, that is normal. We, we've had such um, questions when, when, with treatment for HIV and, um, uh, and, and PEP uh, medications. And the same consultation that helped us through the AIDS epidemic is helping medical professionals through the addiction uh, problem. And they you can call them 24 seven in California and Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. throughout the United, rest of the United States um, and get one-on-one -on -one assistance with a patient who needs um, a, a treatment help and a provider needs a little help. So those are two excellent resources that community can help um, promote and uh, um, with the medical uh, community. And it's Every medical institution, wherever you are, there is a champion. And you can you just need to find that champion. Uh, years ago, parents found me, created me uh, into being a champion. This was, was not, you know, I was just a, a, an emergency physician, didn't know anything specific about addiction, except for people who have drug problems come to the emergency department. And, and a group of parents found me and, you know, trained me up really to become an advocate. And, and somebody like me exists in, in your community. I promise you, you need to find them, give them these resources and they'll be an invaluable resources for the rest of their career. Um, the, the second one is partnership. And, and hospitals need to learn how to work outside the four walls and partner with detox centers, um, rehab centers, warm handoff for addiction specialists, um, peer counselors, this needs to be developed in each community. And, and so the two concrete things that, that everyone can do is number one, find the champion and provide the resources to that champion. And number two is create that partnership. Um, Dr. Lever just does a great job here. I think it's really important for folks to know that, that the removal of the x waiver has been so important, but we haven't seen a dramatic increase of the number of clinicians who are providing MAT. So there's still a lot to do in communities. And I think she gives a great kind of roadmap of how to move forward with that. Um, also, I think it shows how you can work on, it's so important to work on multiple levels, changing legislation, changing policy, making sure institutions implement this, making it easy, having an option to bill, all those things are important. 
Uh, let's move on to our next uh, video. And this video is overdose prevention and outreach with LGBTQ plus communities. In outreach in general, we always believe, you know, outreach where the people are at. And in our case, um, our queer and trans people were frequenting raves, clubs, other community centers, partner organizations, and um, high schools as well. Um, there is a, there's a lot of queer youth in the Southeast LA region that, um, you know, are still under the discretion of their parents. You know, they may not be out, but that's why it was really important that we were able to build those relationships with high school specifically in the Southeast LA region. I think we were at Huntington Park High School and Bell Gardens High School, and we were able to do some outreach there. Um, so, you know, we were just outreaching where the people are at and trying to make sure that we have visibility around the um, things that we're trying to get accomplished. So I think BB said it best when she said, you have to go to where the people are. Um, and so we sort of did that with, um, well, we did do that with the dating app. So we know there's a direct link to drug use and sexual activity um, high, and high risk drug use. So we wanted to get on the dating apps and um, because there's no messaging and we can target certain populations, certain age groups, certain uh, demographics, geolocate, it was a really good return on investment because you could see the amount of impressions we got, the amount of clickable you know, uh, website views. Um, we got a lot of bang for our buck in reaching the folks that live in our area because our area is not very big. So I would say for us, it was thinking outside of the box and uh, moving to more toward a harm reduction uh, model and uh, showing up to where people already are, which was for us, it was online. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you, Brian. And I think on our part, I feel like a lot of that came from, you know, th these are really heavy topics. These are really heavy subjects. Um, so I think for us, what works was kind of, a, you know, balancing that out with the programming that we did, where it's like, you know, they're coming in for a dodgeball game. But obviously, you know, that's not all they're leaving with, you know, they're leaving with some knowledge as well. Um, so I think it's, you know, kind of what to the point that Brian brought up once again is that, you know, meeting people where they're at and making sure that, you know, this is like something that's um, com complex and creating something that gives information in a way that's kind of palatable to the people as well. You know, we are going to give them the truth <laughs> and the hard facts and things like that. But at the same time, you know, we still need to make it something where there is community building and it's not just like rainbow washing or something. Um, BB and Brian both to, just do a great job of showing some really uh, creative ways of doing outreach to the LGBTQ plus community um, and, and really engaging. I, I like how BB says that, you know, it, it, it's community building and then using the dating apps, using some of these social events that are all of that, uh, just very creative in, in their outreach. Uh, for our next uh, presentation, we're going to have the 988 crisis lifeline. This is something that we have uh, the national health, health hotline rather that is uh, new this year and is an excellent ac asset for all communities. So what does 988 do? Um, essentially, it bypasses the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, it makes it easier. It's easier to remember. You can teach it to young people. You can do QR codes for it. It's, it's you know, kind of one of those numbers that you stick in the back of your head and you've got it and it's good to go. It directly connects you to a trained um, crisis management professional on the other end of that line in a local or regional way. Um, so the idea is that you're not calling a national number. Now, the national infrastructure is there if that regional operating um, panel is, is full. Right. So if you called and there was no, you know, buddy there to answer your call, the call automatically gets bumped to the national level. So there's always a safety net there. Um, 
And the crisis counselor then can determine if a wellness check is required. Um, and a wellness check then would be a crisis response. So someone coming to make sure that I, Brooke, am safe in this moment. So there's the interaction with the person who's essentially doing intake or assessment. How serious is this situation? Um, where, how vulnerable is this person? How much danger are they in? Um, and then if it's deemed, okay, talking about this on the phone isn't going to be enough, then there may need a, there may uh, be a need for a crisis response team to go and check on the person physically in person. Now, a couple of things to sort of put into context there. Um, one is everyone is very concerned, does 988 geolocate, meaning if I call, do they know where I am? Um, interestingly, the, the connection that you have to the local or regional um, uh, responder is actually based on the area code of the phone you're using. So for many of us, that's going to be a cell phone. So the area code of your cell phone number, maybe you had a cell phone in New York and now you live in Texas, right? Um, it actually is connecting you to that crisis counselor in New York where your area code is, not in Texas. And so some people have said, hey, that's really good because advocates have said we don't want to geolocate based on call. Would that make someone less likely to call because they're afraid of the response? They're afraid 911 would be um, activated. Maybe there's historical or intergenerational trauma in the community related to that. So some people have said it's a really good thing that 988 doesn't geolocate. Other people have said actually it causes delays because what has to happen then is someone's got to put you on hold and transfer you to the right locale if they want a local person to do a wellness check. So it may be that I'm in Texas and I'm calling and I get someone in New York and maybe the conversation is enough, right? Um, but so there are pros and cons about geolocation. And um, I, there, I know are a couple of studies out there that are looking at that specifically. But right now, um, just so we all know and have a shared mental model about how it operates, 988 uses the area code of the number you're using to call. And that's how you're connected to that resource. The other thing is that um, 988 are, is instructed to answer all calls. The goal is to answer everything, right? Um, and so it's really important for us to know that that assessment might be happening very quickly. So imagine there's a high volume of calls. Um, that assessment may be happening very quickly. And if someone, if it's determined that that person is not in immediate danger, the decision can be made to have them call back later or to schedule a time when someone else will call them. Um, so again, this is a great resource. And I really like the way that Brooke uh, Briggins has goes into some of the practicalities of it. It's being implemented, it's been implemented throughout the country. But as you can see, there's some areas that still are working on and it's, it can be a great partner for your uh, coalitions and for your communities. Uh, we're gonna go on now to the next presentation. And this is harm reduction with faith-based communities. I'm wondering, can you give us some specific examples of you know how this what sort of things you were doing as part of the faith based uh, harm reduction. Well, I mean, and so, and I'm gonna also make room for Hill to jump in here as well. But um, you know, I think it's I mean the kind of beginning piece for much of this I think uh, is connected to uh, education and exploration, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I was talking about my experience, both as a person who uh, used drugs and was seeking healing and connection and care in the context of my faith community, as well as a person who is ordained in a particular denominational um, 
lineage and you know hearing the hearing the culture that surrounded uh surrounded my colleagues and I and our congregations which like I said led often with silence um moralization and you know as we have come to understand it and as faith and harm reduction was founded it was founded in conversation with faith leaders as well as people with lived and living experience and what we heard from faith leaders is that there was a real lack of ability to articulate the drugs issue theologically from mm -hmm you know, positions of power and up against, or, you know, institutional church politics and such. And so we have really endeavored to focus a lot of what we do is A, on the relationship building, but on the education. And so educating faith communities on, you know, I think, I think a lot of us are familiar with harm reduction as we have heard heard it talked about in popular media. So talking about risk reduction strategies to reduce HIV and hepatitis C and overdose and all of these. So syringe service programs, naloxone and more. And folks have also heard about, you know, the principles of harm reduction. So we're, when we talk about it, we talk about lower case HR harm reduction, which is really the principles or the approach to providing those services to communities who are impacted by the war on people who use drugs. And with faith communities, the real in has been in talking about the values base and where harm reduction finds its roots. In fact, we often also lead with the fact that if harm reduction is being practiced without being practiced with these values, that more often than not, it's probably harm inducing. And so when we're talking about this, we're talking about we're really lifting up the values, which is the centering of the humanity of people with lived and living experience of drug use. We're talking about centering their leadership and expertise in all of these conversations. We are talking about developing um, helping churches explore, you know, kind of cultural opportunities to uh, challenge some of the misconceptions about who people who use drugs are and might be. And so that means looking at our language, looking at our liturgy, looking at our policies, which include or exclude. Um, so those are some of the, some of the kind of key ways. I think when the conversation around harm reduction comes up generally, um, it's that we're enabling people to use drugs, <laughs> that, that that is the core problem of harm reduction is that we enable people to use. And I think that looks past so much. Um, if folks are using drugs, then taking away um, sterile syringes, sterile injecting equipment, sterile smoking equipment is not going to make people suddenly stop using drugs. It's just going to make the drug use unsafe. Um, so, you know, cutting through that by explaining that reality is one of the first steps in, in getting past this sort of enabling language. And to say to people of faith, like we are supposed to be present to humanity um, and we're supposed to be treating one another with empathy and compassion and doing things like taking away injecting supplies or safer use supplies, you know, is not that word. It's not, it's not empathetic. Um, it's not caring. So I think that that's the first thing. And I think you know, a lot of faith communities have a strong orientation towards abstinence only recovery, that the only way um, to be is to be sober. And um, I would, I would argue as a person who's usually in Christian spaces, that's not biblical, you know, so we, we need to get past that, um, that you don't have to be sober to be good. And, and so that I think is a big part of the conversation too, and getting churches to think about how can we have resources beyond just an abstinence oriented 12 step group. That's fine if that's working for folks, but there need to be other options. That's pretty limited. There are lots of recovery options and harm reduction in the world beyond that. And I think that's, that's mostly what faith-based spaces are used to hosting. And I think that piece is really critical, especially when we're talking about under-resourced areas of the country, uh, under-resourced in a variety of ways, right? Economically, harm reduction, all these other um, uh, challenges, which really limit opportunities to care for folks, um, you know, at disproportionate risk of 
overdose, uh, since we're talking about this in the context of overdose. And so thinking about the role of faith communities in so many of these spaces and really understanding that, you know, if we're going to use kind of more uh, treatment-based language, the continuum of care, we understand, starts in congregations and starts in communities of faith long before people ever think about or need kind of access um, to those sorts of care. And so they are, we are listening into what our faith leaders are saying and not saying about who we are and who we aren't. And that, you know, includes the kind of silence I was talking about. I, I work at a very progressive church here in New York City. City. And, you know, we preached a sermon on the gospel of harm reduction, and we heard from hundreds of people connected to the community and the congregation that said they had never heard the drugs issue talked about from the pulpit, from a position of, you know, power, uh, so meaning by a clergy person, which included them, their children, their lovers, you know, within the community of the beloved, that they did not hear themselves othered, stigmatized, but rather welcomed in and welcomed in with the wholeness of who they were. And so we started hearing stories about, you know, congregants who had been congregants and still are for decades, um, whose children were incarcerated in Colorado and Florida for nonviolent drug related causes. And that was not something they felt like they could show up to their community of faith with. And so really making these explicit invitations to people and taking advantage of our, taking advantage is the wrong word, but making use of our power as leaders in these spaces to invite folks out of the shadows, to invite folks to, you know, again, show up with their whole selves. I think that's a really critical role that faith leaders uh, can play in this work. Um, I, this is I, 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 this uh, webinar is just amazing the, to see how positively uh, faith can based organizations can participate in in harm reduction and really change the 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 mind frame the 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 hearts and minds of of other uh, faith based communities uh, centering the humanity of individuals who are using or have used uh, drugs. Um, and I, I just love the way that some of the, this is expressed of um, having people show up with their whole self, um, you know, explicitly inviting people out of the darkness. Um, it's just such a, a positive um, program that they have in an area that sometimes can be very moralistic, where stigma can be um, can be so uh, accentuated. So uh, again, very positive. Uh, on for our next uh, presentation, we are going to have, have the next slide. This is one that is really, I hope you will all listen to and, and uh, take some of this, uh, these uh, recommendations home with you, but managing toxic stress and burnout, seven types of rest. Could I have the video, please? So I like to start off our trainings with this quote, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and lost daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk with walk through water without getting wet, right? And so that quote just means that in this, um, the work that you do in interacting with all of your different um, community members and clients and consumers that you serve, you are interacting with a lot of pain and suffering, right? And loss. And on a daily basis, you may be experiencing um, conversations with people who are navigating the toughest times of their lives. And that is bound to have an impact on you, right? And in many times in helping professions, we say, you know, we, we devote so much time and attention and energy and focus to the people that we are trying to take care of. And we don't turn a lot of that compassion inwards. And so this workshop today, um, I really want you to try to think about what are some of the things that you can implement in your everyday life starting today that might help to alleviate some of the stress you may be feeling. Now, up until this point, we have been focusing on your individual well-being, and that's super, super important. But I also um, want to acknowledge that this is really difficult. Like, it's really difficult for us in helping professions to take 
care of ourselves and to engage in all of these different kinds of rest if we don't have the systems and conditions in place to support our wellness, right? So for those of you who are in leadership positions um, in your communities or your organizations, for those of you who are thinking about how systems work, if you are a manager, if you supervise a team, I want to remind you that it is incumbent upon you to um, provide systems and com conditions within your organization to promote healing. Right. So let's go to the next slide and talk about what that means. Um, so we know that organizations can provide conditions for teams to thrive and they can be the reason that teams burn out. Right. Organizations can be healing or they can be re-traumatizing re for folks. And one of the conversations that we're having about workforce now is that we want to diversify the workforce, right? We we always say, like, we want the workforce to reflect the people that we're serving. And um, that doesn't mean that we're just supposed to look at racial, ethnic, or linguistic diversity. It is diversity of lived experiences, right? I I think that the most powerful folks um, who can make a difference in these areas are people who have gone through these struggles themselves and come out the other side, right? So if we are really looking to diversify the workforce, that means that the people joining us are going to come from lived experiences of trauma, um, come with lived experience of substance use and substance use disorder. And maybe it's about changing simple things like our HR policies or the language we use to talk about it. This is, I really encourage you to uh, listen to the whole webinar. It's really, um, as you've seen, it's it's just a wonderful webinar. But I, I particularly like how um, the, the speaker really focuses on how we can influence organizations and including the expanding the, the definition of diversity to ensure that in the work we're doing on overdose prevention, that we are bringing individuals into the workforce, into the, the field with lived and, and living experiences. Um, so important. And that quote by uh, Naomi Raman is just excellent. You know, you are, you're you're living experiences every day, these will affect you to make sure that you do um, take care of yourself. I'm trying to avoid self-care, but, <laughs> but uh, the, the term self-care, which she mentions there, but really, and that your organizations are supporting employees and supporting, supporting volunteers in, in uh, making sure that they are taking care of themselves, that they are taken care of. Very good. We're going to move on to the next slide, the next, uh, please, for our next presentation. And this uh, is about Overdose Prevention 101. Now, Overdose Prevention 101 is a resource that we developed at the National Overdose Prevention Network and the California Overdose Prevention Network because we really saw that in all organizations, I mean, this is, this is a marathon, this is not a sprint. And over the course of addressing the issues of overdose prevention, particularly as it gains in complexity, which we're gonna talk about in some of the, the additional uh, webinars you're gonna be hearing today. People will come, people will go, and there was a need for a resource that could really um, provide the information for people who are, are employees who are joined, some of their existing employees, people who are adding this to additional work that they're doing, onboarding uh, folks, and including board members of organizations. It's a great guide. It's, um, you, you, it's on our website. Here are the two links to it, which you'll be able to um, use when you when you uh, uh, get these slides. But it goes over four areas of overdose prevention, how you can build a, a strong coalition, key evidence-based strategies, also a lot of tools and resources that you can use uh, for your prevention strategies, and um, also a lot of case studies. And this has also a specific um, uh, overdose prevention guide that is focused on rural communities and some of the challenges that rural communities face. So I think you'll find this to be just a very useful tool. We again, with this, we invite you to share this with your partners. If you're you know, in a coalition, share it with everybody in the coalition so that they also have this for, uh, you know, can use it in their organizations. Our next uh, uh, presentation is going to be about xylazine. There's been a lot in the news uh, about xylazine. 
uh, we brought together uh, these individuals who you, you see um, Dr. Aldi, uh, Dr. Wax, and uh, Dr. Colbreth to talk about this. They're from the American College of Mex Medical Toxicology, and they'll talk about the studies they're doing, but also some practical information about xylazine. Do you please put, uh, put the video on? Thank you. So uh, basically, you know, xylazine, xylazine is a, a potent central alpha to um, adrenergic, uh, sorry, agonist. Um, and uh, it's similar, I, whenever I think of xylazine, I think of clonidine, which is a, a drug that's a prescription drug, um, you know, in humans. But xylazine, the difference is, is that it has been used in veterinary medicine um, for a very long time. Um, and it's used for sedation, uh, like a one-time use. So when we see this drug used in animals, it's usually to sedate them one time. And what we're seeing now that it's you know, mixed into uh, fentanyl, but also can be found with other um, illicit drugs, um, is that, you know, we're seeing other effects from it, chronic effects like wounds that we uh, d don't really have reported in, in animals. Um, um, you know, a lot, of, uh, a, lot, a lot of what we know about xylazine um, is from animal studies. There's really uh, not a whole lot known uh, from, from what happens to humans in large doses or, um, you know, there's a, a few case reports like from the 80s um, where veterinarians may have um, injected themselves with it um, and had poor outcomes. But um, overall, there's not much known. The other thing is because it's mixed, uh, we're seeing it mixed into um, the illicit drug supply, you know, a lot of times it's in addition to something. So because of that, it clouds what we know about this drug um, and what we know that this drug can do, because what we're seeing is, you know, a, a stimulant and xylazine or an opioid and xylazine. And so those symptoms um, just from xylazine can sometimes be um, unclear. Um, so Currently, you know, there is some research being done on it. Um, there was a recent animal study that came out looking at um, receptors and, and effects, but um, because it, it was never made for humans, um, we have a very low amount of data on what it does in humans. Uh, so you can see some of our data on the left as well as the right. So the left side, we just present some of the, the relative frequency of xylazine. So among um, the cases of confirmed patient opioid overdoses, which do primarily make up about 90% of our cases. So as I mentioned, we have recruitment um, inclusion criteria for this study based on suspected opioid overdose. Um, and it's true that in 90% of those samples, they do have some sort of opioid. Um, and the other 10% you know, may consist of something like benzodiazepines or cannabinoids or something of that sort. Um, so among those with confirmed opioid exposures, the, the total relative frequency of xylazine is 17%, and that's across all of our sites. Um, so you can see some of the highest, uh, the highest prevalence of xylazine right now is, is still focused in the, in the Northeast with Pittsburgh having the highest um, proportion or prevalence of xylazine among our study and then followed by Mount Sinai. Um, and we do have a lot of xylazine that is being detected in the Midwest. Um, as well as starting to seep across the, the states to the west. Um, interestingly, we have no samples from Denver that tested positive for xylazine to date, um, but we're continuing to kind of keep, keep an eye on that. Um, and then you can see over to the right side, we just have our, um, it basically a, CDC has several dashboards for non-fatal overdoses. And because we're collecting information and enrolling patients who present to emergency departments, um, it's primarily our sample is consistent of non-fatal opioid overdoses. Um, and so that um, the morbidity team at CDC has a few um, data dashboards that they present on their website and they're activated or um, sorry, they're updated pretty frequently with the data that we are getting coming in because we're actively collecting data um, for this study. And so this, the, um, the dashboard is called the Fentalog dashboard. And basically you can go in and see, and we do have a um, data point on xylazine. So the fentanyl and xylazine samples make up about 20%. Um, and that's of all of the, the samples. Mm -hmm. And I do just wanna, oh, go ahead. Kim. Thank you, Rachel, for introducing that. I just wanted to, again, bring your attention to this left, um, left-sided graph. I mean, it's just so interesting. You know, we have uh, sites around the country 
um, in, both in this study and the next study that that you're going to present, uh, Rachel. But um, you know, it, it's not necessarily all northeast. You know, we're starting to see it flow um, to the west. And when we first started this project in 2020, and we started seeing xylazine roll in, you know, at that time we were not uh, really that well versed in what xylazine was. Um, but as this project has progressed, we can see that um, xylazine is also um, becoming more prevalent. Um, not only in the Northeast, but in other areas of the country over time, which is just a really uh, interesting uh, thing for us to see uh, in this project. Yes, thank you, Kim. And that's a great point too. I mean, in terms of um, not only geographical diversity of, of what we're seeing with xylazine, but also the co-occurrence with other substances. So a lot of times xylazine is found amongst um, a host of other substances. So it's not just fentanyl and xylazine that we're finding in the blood. It's a number of um, adulterants, which may be, you know, mixed in with some of the drugs uh, that people are pur purchasing, or it could be um, some of the novel psychoactive benzodiazepines. We're finding um, a high proportion of those in the xylazine samples. And so I think the, the also the take home point is that there are, it's not just fentanyl and xylazine most of the time. We're interested in knowing what are the implications for communities? Maybe Rachel, you can give us your perspective on this, you know, in, and what is, how, what, how is this impacting communities in terms of harm reduction needs, in terms of um, how we can support uh, individuals using drugs who are using uh, uh, drugs that are, do in, include um, sarazine? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and, you know, with talking with uh, some harm reduction um, providers in some of the other projects that we work with, you know, a lot of people are passing out sort of wound kits, you know, regardless if they have a wound or not, because if they, as they, as we are detecting xylazine, you know, in patients' blood um, in certain areas, you know, anecdotally providers um, on the front lines are seeing it as well. So some of the harm reduction providers who are handing out for say, a, you know, a naloxone kit may also hand out a wound care kit and some resources to go. And I think one of the biggest barriers um, that, you know, I think is a, a community um, or needs to be a community approach to this is, is how to kind of address these wounds as a barrier to inpatient care. Um, so inpatient detox, inpatient care, I think all of that is really important um, in terms of, of, you know, addressing all of that. Um, and then uh, another thing for, for harm reduction approaches is, you know, just making sure that um, and I'll, I'll let Kim and um, Paul, you know, comment more on this, but in terms of naloxone, I mean, because the fentanyl is so potent in the drug supply that naloxone is still going, you know, the, one of our best, um, you know, tools in our toolbox to, to fight um, the opioid epidemic. And so, um, and because xylazine is so often found with fentanyl that, you know, naloxone is still um, one of the best products to use. So. The major confounding issues with xylazine, you know, is exactly what Kim just mentioned, is, is, is the increasing stigmatization of patients that use drugs that include xylazine. Because of these wounds, they may be less uh, interested in getting, uh, you know, treatment just because of being ostracized. Uh, and um, it may be more difficult to keep them in treatment um, yeah, you know, because of you know their concerns about the wounds. So I think that's that's part of it for those who have the wounds. And then also, as we mentioned with the buprenorphine, some more challenges with you know potentially precipitated withdrawal and having a bad experience trying to be induced on buprenorphine and kind of giving up and not wanting um, that that sort of you know treatment. Uh, and so they continue to use the drugs at you know high risk for you know death and and, and more serious morbidity. So I th I think those are you know, some of the confounding issues that xylosine has brought to the table. You know, the takeaway for me is to realize that all illicit drugs are likely polydrug exposures. All overdoses that come into the emergency department, into the hospital are likely, um, you know, multi-drug overdoses just based on the data that we're seeing and, um, and even, you know, drug testing that we're seeing um, that people are, you know, they seize drugs and they test it and they can see that. So um, just realizing that, I think that's the biggest takeaway, um, being open that, you know, maybe um, naloxone is not going to be um, curative for someone with an opioid overdose because there may be other things on board like illicit benzos or xylazine. 
Um, this last video of ours really speaks to, um, I think, so well to, to this major complexity that we're seeing in, in uh, kind of the evolution of, of the overdose epidemic we have, and that this is polysubstance use. Uh, it just affects every aspect of this. I mean, as, as the last speaker was saying, with multiple drugs, how is the presentation of, a, of an overdose uh, when you have a combination of stimulants, opioids, benzodiazepines? Um, how do you respond to that, that acute overdose? Uh, and very important to state, use naloxone. Uh, you know, it, that is uh, uh, very important to, to not overthink it, just to get, do the uh, resuscitation and use naloxone. Uh, but then how the the whole aspect of how what is the the treatment longer term in terms of uh, with polysubstance use, where we know that we have buprenorphine, we have other medications, methadone, but there are other we for uh, stimulants, uh, contingency management, but it's very complex. And we haven't mentioned alcohol, which is involved in many of these uh, uh, overdoses also. Um, then this issue of additional stigma, I mean, you know, we're, we're working so hard to address stigma, the, the stigmatization because of the wounds and um, this also entering into the, the whole picture. And then harm reduction, handing out wound kits, it does uh, require, as this moves across the country, uh, very important. I think the other aspect that mentioned is so important is that I like very much about their study is they really show you have uh, cities like Denver where they had no... Uh, 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 Xylazine in the in the samples and others uh, in the East Coast with uh, high prevalence. So we know there are trends across the country, but it's so important to know what's going on in your community. And as a prior speaker said, to respond to the needs of your community. So I think this whole group of, of videos just shows the importance of the work you're doing, the incredible work that that uh, others are doing also that you can learn more about through NOPEN, through other sources. Let us know what how we can best serve your communities what would be helpful to you you again can look at these uh videos and uh you there we want them to be shared as broadly as you'd like to uh share them this learning community is so valuable and we really appreciate your participation in this learning community here you have our, our website and uh thank you so much for participating with us